Your call has been forwarded to an automatic voice message system. My tone is not available. At the tone, please record your message. When you have finished recording, you may hang up or press 1 for more options. Look who it is. The stranger that came out of nowhere and now has everyone talking. Some people want you to be a savior. A shining beacon of hope. Those people clearly haven't met you yet. Hello. Hi, um, this is Christine Dunford. I'm calling from Los Angeles, and I'm trying to reach Matt. I wanted to talk about uh, Outer Worlds, which is the most recent release of a game that I've done. And I'd be interested to talk to you and to sort of be able to talk to your audience a little bit about just my involvement in the game and, and what it was like working with the good folks at Obsidian and game life in general for a voice actor and uh, and some of the other things that I've been doing uh, on camera as well. So I would love to hear from you. Give me a call, Matt, whenever you get a chance. Thank you so much. Goodbye from uh, sunny California. So on the line, we have Christine Dunford talking to us. From where are you talking to us from, Christine? From currently sunny but recently very smoky Los Angeles. Smoky, you say? Yes, we have had our now predictable fire season, uh, which comes around about every September, October. I always say that it's the West Coast of America's equivalent of the East Coast snow days. It comes every fall, and it's when all the school kids in Los Angeles get free days off because we get these wildfires that sweep through L.A., and, um, and the schools close, and people pack up their evacuation bags, and it's sadly predictable. But uh, we've had a little break in the weather, so the skies are clear again, and everybody's back in their houses, and hopefully we've seen the end of it now that it's November. I've always had a interesting question for americans so you can actually answer this because we're sort of a couple of days after after it's happened here do you guys have bonfire night we do not what is bonfire night so we had guy fawkes it's basically what v v for vendetta was basically based on and we set off fireworks and burn effigies of jeremy corbyn and boris johnson (laughs) and trump I was going to say, make sure you include dot, dot, dot. Dot, 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 yeah. And that's that's basically it. So you guys don't have it? We don't. You know, we are big on fireworks on the 4th of July. But no, we do not have bonfire night. And I think here, especially in California, there's such a prohibition on um, bonfires. You can have bonfires on the beach because it's sand and there's not a lot of brush around but uh it's it's pretty prohibited here in california i don't think we have it anywhere else in the states though there is a fair amount of political protest and we do have our wonderful giant baby donald balloon that floats around but that's as far as we get to that kind of uh unified uh raging against the machine activity rage against the machine (laughs) <laughs> we've had a lot of that recently here it's a good thing well obviously it's a completely different world in the uk as it is from the us in fact yeah. it's an outer world <laughs> it's an outer world mm. smooth smooth segue yes outer world this is the game that i think it was just released last week and i have just been starting to get feedback from other people in the industry, people who do voice work in games, as well as just friends that are gamers. And of course, I have a almost 20 year old son. So he's my kind of go to for gamer feedback. And it's been well reviewed. And uh, people seem to really be enjoying it. And from what I've seen on YouTube, people sort of showing their own gameplay, it looks really, really fun. I mean, I know when I recorded the couple of characters that I did for it, I got, you know, to see the visuals of the world and it just, it looks spectacular. It reminds me of, you know, 10, 15 years ago, the first time I saw 
the worlds in World of Warcraft, where you were just kind of stunned by one vista after another, and as you traveled through the world, another beautiful thing was revealed. And it's sort of the same with Outer Worlds. Uh, it's just gorgeous and lush and detailed. It's just a beautiful world to play in. Mm. Now, I mean, a lot of the um, cast in this game is is voice acting. It's not mocap, as it were. Right. You've told me it's an RPG. It's got an RPG element to it. Right. When I right. think about games, say, in the next five years or so, I'm encouraged to think about RPGs as potentially going so far as to be VR. Yes. I will tell you, having done motion capture, when I did Infamous, Second Son, that was motion capture, performance capture. And at the time, I think it was 2012 or 13, the equipment was the latest equipment that they had. And it's since advanced even more. But we had these headsets that had almost like metal antlers six or eight of them coming out of this helmet that you'd wear and they curved down to focus with little cameras on the ends at your face mm. and they caught micro movements like the most subtle indications movements of the eye movements of the lip a quiver uh, an anxious look and it was just amazing to have so much detailed performance captured for the audience i was pretty new to certainly motion capture, but I hadn't even done that many video games. Troy Baker and Travis Willingham and Laura Bailey, they were the old hands. And talking to them, even back then, it felt like, oh, this is so quickly advancing towards VR. Because we were sort of experiencing it. You know, we were interacting with each other, but our micro movements were being caught uh, from every possible camera angle and we thought this is about really putting the player inside the frame of mind of the character even though you're outside the character looking at them it just seemed that there was such a move towards intimacy and really inhabiting the character's varying points of view that virtual reality that would definitely be one of the next steps and i i just think it's going to be thrilling i think it's going to be a very different experience, but I, I think it's going to appeal to so many more people than are even playing now. Mm. As I was saying, like the visuals in Outer Worlds, as you move through the world, you're enveloped with all the detail and the lushness of the environment. And, and I just think, oh, it makes you want to step into it. It's so inviting and engaging. And I just think that's absolutely the natural progression is into VR. I cannot wait. I mean, on the flip side, there's actually nothing wrong with having an RPG where you can walk around and, and you know, talk to people. And, you know, the old Final Fantasy games, Fallout. I mean, I could go on and on and on with, with these. Different mm. kinds of games will sort of lend themselves more organically to one format or the other. There are still games, like you said, RPG games and especially multiplayer games. You know, those may be more enjoyable depending on the particular story and the, you know, the world that it's set in, those might be better suited to, you know, just the kind of technology we have now. And then I think that there are those that will be, that will lend themselves more organically to VR. I think it'll just broaden the, the palette, the tools available. I cannot wait to really have a great experience in VR in a game setting. Christine, before we go on to the actual game production, I want to share something with you. All right. I went to Comic-Con this must have been two weeks ago. Mm. Troy Baker was there, would you believe, actually? Aww. Yeah. I have to say, he is a really good ambassador for the gaming world and very, very generous with fans. He certainly was generous to me. When I did Infamous with him, it was the first time I'd done motion capture. And, you know, just getting into that suit, which is all whole endeavor. You're in that suit, and basically you're not getting out of it for the length of the workday. You're sort of flopping around in this skin-tight thing with dots all over you, and you've got a million dots painted on your face. And he was so generous with his, uh, you know, very deep knowledge of uh, of gaming in general, but working with motion capture in particular. Uh, and so was Travis Willingham. They all are really, really generous with their time mm -hmm. and uh, with their expertise. And I have to say, when I was getting ready to do the game, I sort of looked up on IMDb and I looked up, you know, what, what all of these other people in the, in the game were doing. And 
there are photos of Troy all over the world at cons. And, you know, I think it's a really wonderful thing to have warm, kind, articulate ambassadors for the gaming world at these events. And they, they know, we all know how lucky we are, A, to do what we do, but B, to have a fan base that is so really deeply saturated in the world. You know, these are people who love the work so much. There's something about gamers and game developers and actors who work in game. The common thread through all of them is the love for um, the deep backstories, you know, the origin stories and the real sense of truthfulness. Like, does this make sense for what this character would do? There's no better arbiter of, of whether something really works in a game as far as character is concerned than a really passionate fan. Mm. And they invest as much investigation into the origin story or previous versions of the game as anybody who's actually working on it. Mm. Um, so this sense of really, truly, authentically wanting to connect to fans and kind of appreciate them in return you know, for being there. Gaming is, is the biggest growing sector in the entertainment industry right now. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, nobody, nobody who does what I do for a living takes that for granted. Mm -hmm. And I think somebody like Troy is such a great example of someone who just really, really appreciates having the opportunity to connect to fans and say thank you back to them. Mm -hmm. At Comic-Con, I was put into a room and they said, do you want to try VR? I said, yes. Yes, I do. I really want to try this. And they didn't tell me what it was at all. They didn't say, this is the next game. This is whatever it is. Mm. So they strapped me into this headset. I'm sure you know what I'm, I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they give me these hooks that are sort of like hand hooks. And they said, right, it's, it's blank. Is it blank? Yes, yes, it's blank. Okay. Just remember, you're in this room, right? So, obviously, I'm I'm standing right next to you. So, if you sort of put your hand out, you can feel me. Because, obviously, I can't see a thing. So, okay, fair enough. Basically, they counted it down. And it was the VR for the new Doctor Who video game. Yeah. I'm jealous. <laughs> yeah. So, you're thinking, okay, this is going to be something good. And they do it in the proper, like, title screen. But then you turn around and it, it's actually in the vortex, if that makes sense. So I'm thinking, what could be the best thing they, they throw at me to start off with? And literally, I really want to tell the listener here this. I was in the TARDIS. And you could walk around it. And it was one of the weirdest things I've ever done. <laughs> and then she says, right, you're going to program and steer the TARDIS. And she, yeah, she basically says now you've got to press that and that and do that and obviously you've got these hooks in front of you and the screen's yeah. telling you how to move the switches if that makes sense with your hand yeah in order to pilot i wasn't very good if i'm really honest it took me about five <laughs> minutes to work out what i was doing so obviously you do that and then you go right now push the lever and you actually get to pop a pull the, the handbrake i suppose it is the handbrake and it mm. goes off so I was thinking, okay, that that's that was pretty good, and then you land, and then you walk to the door. You know where this is going, don't you? You walk to the door. No, I don't. You walk to the door, and she says, "Right, well, open the door." So you open the door like a proper key lock, and you walk out, and it's an alien planet. <sighs> oh. Yeah, you know that whole thing where they go about it's bigger on the inside and all that stuff. You actually walk around it, and and you can see around it. And you can see back in inside it, and it's just the weirdest thing ever. Oh my gosh! How long did you get to stay in there? About ten minutes. Did you yeah. want to leave? No. <laughs> did you want to move in? Obviously, there's a trailer afterwards, so you can see what's what's coming. You get to fight right. Daleks. You get to fight the Weeping Angels. There's a bit where you can't wow. you can't blink. You can't actually blink on the on the on the headset. There you go. There's your Christmas present coming, Christine. How's that? Seriously. Mm. You know, it makes me think of, I mean, and I guess the Harry Potter exhibit opened a, a year ago. Mm. Um, the one at Universal. I think it is. Yeah, Universal. Or is it Epcot? I can't remember which uh, which 
venue it is. But you think about these kids who've read the books, mm. or maybe they've just seen the movie, or maybe both, and just how thrilling it is to actually walk in a diagon alley. Mm. And, you know, it's like a 3D movie set. On a movie set, you'd open the door to the wand shop and it would just be a flat there'd be nothing back there but this is actually a three-dimensional at concrete walk through environment you can of course buy things mm. the lines are legendary people will mm. wait mm. hours to get to go on these rides and to actually walk through the environment and that's in the real world you know that's not even vr that's how much people are dying to sort of experience what they've seen on film and I just, I just think it's so exciting to think about all of that, to actually be able to go into these environments. Mm. Oh, too much fun. A bit of a sort of a sore question here in terms of the outer worlds. Do you feel they missed a trick by not putting it in VR or part of the game in VR? I don't think so. I mean, I've watched a couple of people on YouTube, you know, in their gameplay, and I can see them sort of working out the various quests and, it seems compelling enough. There's enough that is challenging in the environment that I, I think it engages you and immerses you fully enough. But I certainly think that, you know, Outer Worlds, some of these franchises, they can just go on and on and on. There's one world after another to explore, and so many iterations of it are, are sort of just in the offing. And I think that they could go there eventually, but I don't know that the game suffers at all I think it, it's it's immersive enough, and I think the quests are challenging enough, and they certainly there's a broad enough spectrum in terms of the level of engagement. People can engage with the game very much in terms of the quests and the points and discovering different skills and having different you know melees and and all of that combat stuff. But there's also a very philosophical kind of post-apocalyptic thematic thing that you can engage with. If that's how you're coming to the game as an individual, I really like these games that sort of challenge you to think about how you would behave in a world where the ethical rules were very different, you know, and, and um, I'm on this show here. I don't know that it's in in the UK yet, but it's called The Purge and it's the TV version of uh, the films. And it's kind of it's along the lines thematically of the walking dead it asked the viewer to do the same thing which is you know go ahead and imagine what you would do if you were faced with these ethical concerns everybody thinks they know how they would behave if they had to make a choice between good and evil altruism and self-interest we all think we know but really push comes to shove nobody can say for certainty how they would respond to really extreme circumstances. And shows like Walking Dead or The Purge or games like Outer Worlds can engage you on that level. They can sort of put you in that environment and say, you get to be a hero, or you could really act in self-interest or or kind of be nihilistic and say, I don't know, what happens if I do let the world go up in flames? Let's see what happens. I just want to see. So I think, you know, as to the question of how how the game would be served if it was VR versus as it is now. I don't know. I think that there's enough there that can engage you on a very simple level in terms of combat and skills, and it also engages you on a profound level in terms of who you want to be in the context of this world and its ethical boundaries. So I think that there's enough. There's enough there. It's a rich enough environment that it immerses you. And I don't know that it suffers for not being VR. Well, obviously, let's talk about the game's production. What was production of the game like for you? Oh, my God, so much fun. I mean, you know, as an actor, you get the sides. That's what they call the audition scenes. And you sign a million NDAs and you swear in your mother's life that you'll never give away anything that you've seen, you know, in the audition pages and that you'll you'll hand them in at the audition. And, uh, boy, does it whet your appetite because you just... Not only do you need as much information as you can as you can get to make informed choices about the way the character is and how they speak and behave, but you're just dying to see, you know, what this world is. And when you actually get to the point where you're meeting the developers and you're in there with the voice director and you're actually going to do the session and they get to show you the visuals, I mean, 
you just feel like you're getting a peek into something so exciting and new and it's just so much fun and you get to hear a little bit of what the other voice actors have done and they really do their best to give you a sense as as full a sense as possible of the tone of the world the tone of for example the humor there's a very dark kind of naughty <laughs> humor to this and that's one of those things that in production you find yourself going through a scene and then you get to kind of put your head together with whoever's directing the voice work and they say you know what we really want to kind of lean into the kind of edgier more cynical humor here and you get to kind of finesse the details and the the subtleties that way and it's it's really really fun and as i said before nobody cares as deeply about backstory and intention and all the forces that sort of have given rise to this world and the people in it actors have that depth of understanding to the degree that game developers do and it's it's always such a fun collaboration so i play Adelaide McDevitt who is one of the people that you meet early in the game and she's a little bit more of a primary figure early in the game and then there was this other character Abigail and she's sort of a side quest person and she's just this you know really interesting older woman and she borders on the inappropriate with everybody who comes into her apothecary and i mean we we kept walking right up to the edge when we were sort of developing her you know going through take after take right up to the edge of being really inappropriate and and almost downright creepy <laughs> in terms of her uh you know the civious undertones <laughs> somebody posted their youtube interplay with this character abigail and and this player's responses to her it was so satisfying because he was he was laughing and at the same time going ew this is like talking to somebody's creepy inappropriate handsy grandmother and it's just so satisfying as somebody who you know was in the booth with all the other creatives going is this too much let's walk right up to the line how much can we get away with let's see what happens if we go here and then seeing how how well it lands in terms of the player's experience and of course these games are so they're so calibrated now that the character's response is really it's connected it's calibrated to how the player is interacting with them. So if you're not pushing the character to that extreme, they don't go there. So, you know, for uh, somebody who's younger or does not want to have that kind of interaction, they won't be they won't be as a player precipitating it. They'll be interacting with the character in a different level because, you know, we record so many responses so that we can really be specific to what the player is asking of us and how they're engaging with us. Well, obviously, you mentioned that you haven't played it yourself, and I'm sort of going to get a bit personal by saying your son has, obviously. Yes, he has, yes. What did he think of it? He loved it, and I have to tell you, he sort of forgot that I was in it, and I mentioned doing this interview with him, and he said, wait a minute, you, you're in Outer Worlds? And I said, yes, I told you this. Yeah, I'm playing with these two characters. And he said, oh, my God. And then he sort of shouts off. I was FaceTiming with him. He's at college. Hey, you guys. He's living in a fraternity house. You guys, my mom, she's in it. And it's just, you know, for mm. me, there's no greater uh, compliment than your son being excited that you're in a game. I remember when I did Infamous, uh, it was like a little badge of honor. My son he doesn't often care about a lot of the things I do, independent movies or, you know, broadcast network TV, that kind of thing. It's not in his, it's just not in his frame of reference. But a game like this, he was very proud of his mother, made me feel very happy. And they are really, really enjoying the game. They're really liking it. They haven't gone through the whole thing yet. There's a lot of game time. I think it's like 30 hours or something like that. So they haven't gone through the whole thing yet. They mm. do, on occasion, have to go to class. Mm. So mm. they haven't been able to devote all of their time <laughs> to the game. So they're not quite through all of the iterations of it. Probably they'll finish up this weekend. Mm. Are there any sort of funny anecdotes you can share about the production of the game? This game in particular? Yeah. Oh, well, when we were doing Abigail, and it really is funny because... Adelaide was the character that we spent most of the time on. And then uh, they said, you know, we have this other character and we'd like you to do that as well. Sure, of course, let's look at it. 
And as I said, we were sort of really walking, pushing the line, walking right up to the edge of what is and isn't appropriate with a character like this. And there were times where I would have to stop because I would laugh. And then there were times where I'd finish recording and I'd wait and there'd be no sound. And in this particular uh, studio, I could not see. Often you can see on the other side of the booth's glass, you can see the people, the voice director and the engineers. And uh, in this particular studio, I couldn't see them. And there was this long lag and I thought, did I suck? Was that bad? What is that? Oh, it's silence. And then I kind of leaned towards the door and opened it a little bit and I could hear these gales of laughter coming from inside the engineering booth and I thought oh all right they, they're they're just enjoying this as much as I am we had to stop fairly often uh it was <laughs> it was a pretty inefficient session but I think it really yielded an enjoyable character for the uh for the players for the game but yeah yeah mm. a lot of laughter a lot of laughter well, let's talk a bit about you, you yourself, Christine. What made you want to get into acting in the first place? Ah. Ah. <laughs> you know, I'm old. I have to think back. I will tell you, I was very much an apartment kid. I grew up in New York City, in the Bronx, and I just spent an awful lot of my time indoors, hooked on TV, and I just really loved watching performance. I mean, I, I loved watching TV, but really, I remember I was a, an odd couple devotee, and I would just watch Tony Randall's performance, and I don't know, I just, I loved watching actors, and I think I just, I don't know, I was just really, really into performance, watching performance from an early age, and then I went to uh, college, and for lack of a better major, uh, started taking theater history classes, and then just kind of forced myself to try it. And then when it was time to leave university, I auditioned for uh, Juilliard, and uh, then I went there for four years. So that was it. That's my trajectory. I, I really have nothing more interesting than I loved watching actors and eventually found my way to doing it. Well, now I'm going to shock you a little bit more because I've been to a number of cons this year and this is in part and parcel to the, to the next question. Boston Legal is a, is a show that you were on yes. for two episodes and I yeah. met for about 30 seconds this year in June, I met the wonderful William Shatner. Oh, mm. oh he's a divine man. Yes. I have to tell you, when we shot that show, this is so interesting. So that was maybe 10 years ago. Mm. I'm not sure how old he is now. But let's say safely, at the time, he was 70. We had, as we always do, very early calls. So 5 a.m., you, know, you go and you sit in makeup, and you get to the set at 6.30. 6.30 in the morning, William Shatner bounds onto the set. And not only is he fully caffeinated, energetic, passionate... Obviously, you know, off book, well prepared, but he is excited about the scene that we're about to shoot. And he comes in and the first words out of his mouth, you know, good morning. So nice to meet you. I had an idea about this scene. What if we started over here? This is somebody who's been doing this since he was in his early 20s, 50 odd years later, still coming onto the set. It's barely light out. So lit on fire with excitement about the work, just the work delighted to be there gracious to everybody i just i could not be happier with having worked with him i feel so lucky and i was a star trek maniac when i was younger i went to a um, we have these specialized high schools in new york city uh for math and science and i went to the school called the bronx high school of science and this was in the 70s and star trek was you know a massive thing at my school and people would we had these mechanical drawing classes and everybody was drawing the starship enterprise and sort of making mechanical drawings of the various levels of the enterprise and we knew everything about it and i i was anxious about meeting him because i had adored him so much when i was young but he he's just one of those people who comes onto the set and it's just he brings so much light and life and he's passionate and then you know at lunch he's talking about his horses and his dogs and all the charities that he works for and he's just oh my gosh what an amazing 
guy, fantastic actor, just a lovely, lovely human being. I adore that man. Especially at the age of 88. 88, okay, so he was yeah. in his mid-70s, late mm. 70s when I worked when with him. When you met him, yeah. And I'm telling you, there were, I won't name names, there were leads on that show who came in late, who didn't know their lines, who were kind of, your guys are lucky I'm here. And there's Bill Shatner on time, ready to go, on fire about the work. Oh, he's just such a beautiful example of, you know, just somebody who is just one of a kind. He wouldn't let me shake his hand. This is okay because I walked home with an absolute smile on my face. I went to London Aww. and I went on a smile face. And do you know why, Christine? Why? Because I fist bumped him. Oh. <laughs> Not many people can say they fist bumped William Shatner. You fist bumped Captain Kirk? I know. That is a big deal. <laughs> and I got a signature. Aww. But, but <laughs> this is obviously going into part and parcel the question about your TV series career, basically, because you've been on a heck of a lot of TV series. Yes. Yes, 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 which yes. have been your favourite actors to work with and why? And which which oh. TV series sort of stand out in particular? Well, you know, the one I have just finished, The Purge, I will say the first person that comes to mind is Max Martini. Not only does he have maybe the greatest name on television at all right now, Max Martini, but he's one of the leads in The Purge. And he he's another one of these guys, like, like Bill Shatner, who just is so on top of his game, gracious to everybody, warm, patient, lovely, just a really great guy to work with and has the coolest voice. It's just like the golden tones of Max Martini. And he's fantastic on the show. There's an American actor, Jerry Burns. He was on a bunch of sitcoms in the 90s, and that's really where I did the bulk of my TV work, was, was on comedies in the 90s. And he and I did a series called Something About You. It was back in the heyday of all the American sitcoms, the titles of which had entirely too many prepositions. All About You, Something About You, You and I, Me and Her. Jerry and I were on a show together, and he is a comic genius. Jerry Burns is so, so funny. And I saw him on the Norman Bates show. Mm. And he had an arc on that playing a very twisted, dark guy. And I loved seeing it because I love when people who are super, super funny also have that great, dark, dramatic streak. Who else have I loved? I did a show with Brad Garrett. Uh, he was on a show called Everybody Loves Raymond, and I think he won a bunch of awards for it. And uh, he and I did a show called Till Death, another guy who's just, you know, walks on the set filled with excitement and passion and bubbling with ideas. Well, obviously, I like asking this question because obviously you're full of life. Your career's going splendidly is there any sort of characters that you would like to do still because I'm, I'm just thinking because you mentioned obviously you were a star trek buff would you ever consider doing something like discovery or or picard which is obviously the newest one i would give my right arm you know it's an interesting thing uh i was in the makeup chair when we were shooting the purge and max martini was next to me and he said, and again, in deference to the many NDAs that one signs and the purges on the air now, so I won't say anything too specific, but he did say to me, man, your, your character, you're getting worse and worse. And I said, I know, I know. And he said, do you, do you play characters like this a lot? And I said, you know, now that I think of it, I started to think about all right, so there's Infamous, and then there's The Purge, and I started racking them up, and I said, you know, that's kind of all I've been doing for the last 10 years, one character after another, and kind of building this cottage industry and villainesses, and I like it. So I would, yes, I would love to be on a sci-fi show. And again, I'm so drawn to these kind of post-apocalyptic or alternate reality things where you really get to challenge the ideas of what you think you would do, what you what you fancy would be your steadfast code of morality, and, and actually having that challenge. I love that for audiences. And as an actor, I love playing the person who sort of provokes actions that are less than honorable. I love that. I love that. And I have to say, as a woman, I really love that. You know, when people write female villains, 
often the tendency is to really work hard to justify. Well, you know, she's evil because her children were taken. There has to be this um, kind of justification. And then once in a while you get a character who's, you know, a female villain who's just evil just because, just because she likes it. And it's so much fun to sort of play the possibility of a, a human being who happens to be female who has no moral conscience. I mean, if somebody wrote the female Trump, how fun would that be? You'd have to really do a mind bender to be able to get there, you know, as an actor. But how fun would that be? I would love to play a really heartless villain in in a great alternate universe or sci-fi show. I really would. I mean, this seems to be a running thing in these podcasts, especially in November, December, and I've got a feeling that the film's going to be nominated for an Oscar next year. I've got this feeling. But something like The Joker, perhaps. Yes. Mm. Yes. Although with The Joker, you know... I haven't seen it yet, but my understanding is that, you know, they go to great lengths to sort of explain the origin story, how it is he came to be. And I'm sort of tickled by the idea that you could have a female villain who just, who was just born with a little chip missing or an extra chip, you know, a little, a little psychopathic chip added into the mix. I love that. I just think that would be so much fun to play. Somebody who's evil just because. It's terrifying. I, I agree with you, though, from what I've heard about the Joker, and I'm actually seeing it tomorrow, the scuttlebutt is that it's going to sort of find its way into every award category. I'm not going to mention anything I've heard about it, because it will spoil it, but there's a scene in particular, which I haven't seen it, bear in mind, but my mate has, and he said, there's a scene that literally I was honestly thinking, what the hell is going on here? Because <sighs> it's a piece of music... I mean, it's controversial now why they put it in, but it's clever as to why they put it in. And as soon as it starts, you'll be thinking, no. Once you've seen it, we'll we'll talk tomorrow and you can message me on on wherever. You'll say, I know which scene you're talking about. I will. And I will not give it away. No. You're going to see it, though, yes? Yeah, I'll see it. I'll see it eventually, but yeah. I mean, there's another thing as well. What about a Marvel or DC villain? I mean, Marvel's pretty big now, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Mm. Oh, my gosh, yes. So interesting that, you know, there's been this hubbub this week because Martin Scorsese had said something about those big franchise films, and he said something about them. You know, they're not real cinema. And he had to go back and qualify. I mean, people took him out of context. And what he meant was that in terms of the progression of characters, you know, there's a limit as to where you can take them. And uh, he didn't mean it in a derogatory way. But I actually find that there's something so satisfying about the expectations for a film in a franchise, you know, for example, the Marvel franchise, and then the delivery of them. I don't think that that precludes subtlety or surprising delights in terms of performances or even script, but I like the idea that something is crafted to be satisfying and it delivers. I really am thinking twice now that maybe tomorrow I'll see Jojo Rabbit because when I saw Thor, I just thought, okay, Taika Waititi, I have to now see everything that he's ever directed because that, that to me is such a great example of a franchise film that delivers on its promise. The audience goes with a certain expectation of the kind of enjoyment they're going to be having. And yet it was filled with unpredictable humor, fantastic pushing of the edges of, of humor, and it was uh, layered and in moments dark. And that's, I think, you know, in great part due to Taika Waititi and his sensibility. But that's a great example of something that is a franchise film that is also just, that is um, greatly affected by the person directing it and maybe one of the best of the franchises that uh, there have been. It might be the best. Well, I'm going to give you a one minute plug, Christine. One minute plug to <laughs> plug The Outer Worlds and Anything else you've got coming up which doesn't contravene any NDA agreement that you've signed? All right. Well, definitely do play Outer Worlds. The world is lush, it's engaging, it's immersive, obviously. And you really will get to sort of play at whatever level of engagement you like. It really offers a lot for somebody who just wants to go through the quests and melee the heck out of the game. But then you can engage with it on a, on a more profound level, if you wish, and see 
you know, what rabbit hole you want to go down. If you want to be heroic, if you want to play at a hero, if you want to sort of be nihilistic and, and let the chips fall where they may and, and be amused at the results, it really will offer you an awful lot of fun. And the performances, uh, not mine in particular, the performances are fantastic. The voice works wonderful. And I would say, see The Purge. Uh, season two, season one was great. Uh, season two, which here in the States, I think we're on the fourth episode coming this next week. It's just fantastic storytelling. You know, it's shot beautifully. It's dark and uh, they service an awful lot of characters, but no storyline is ever given short shrift. Uh, the writing's fantastic and very layered. It's kind of amazing what they managed to accomplish and cover and tie up in 10 episodes uh but it's very good storytelling so i would say outer worlds the perch enjoy well christine it's been a pleasure interviewing you pleasure talking to you matt thank you so much mm, obviously we'll have to get you back now well i'd love to come back mm. Mm. Uh, and i will message you after i've seen okay now i'm really up in the air it's either going to be jojo rabbit in which case i'll probably just message a bunch of exclamation points or it's going to be the joker and maybe i'll I don't know if I can handle both in one day. That would be quite a, a, quite a day to do those two films in one day. I, I might have to do a Saturday-Sunday. Devote the weekend to good good films and see one, then the other. The Joker and then Jojo Rabbit. I'll um, tweet you the scene I think that you'll be shocked at because they've done a music video of, of the film. So oh, e- everybody fantastic. knows what the song I'm thinking of is, hopefully. Uh, but That's obviously great. you don't, <laughs> which is the best part. <laughs> well, Christine, it's been a pleasure interviewing you. So nice talking to you, Matt. Thank mm. you so much. Thanks very much for your time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.